Good morning, Mom, in St. John with Joan. How exciting is that? I wish Carrie was here with me, my cruise buddy. <laughs> Uh, but she's in Fredericton. Carrie, I almost tried to find her t-shirt. I, I went looking for her t-shirt in my routine. This yeah. time, a few years ago, Carrie and I were on a cruise on St. Patrick's Day week. It was pretty fun. Mm. And, uh, but I do have my St. Patrick's yeah. Day. I was going to use a headband, but I felt like it might, I felt a little bit like the 1980s. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I decided it would be a great necklace. Okay, and today I, uh, I'm wearing a uh, dark green uh, dress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Rod says, you know, Maureen's wearing green. Mm. So, you know, we're, we're getting a little early mm. celebration. It's funny, we're missing my shirt. Green for um... hey, Carrie's t shirt? That was our t shirt. Um, Happy go lucky. Happy Day. Oh, right. Okay. I love it. Wednesday. Let me take a picture. Leave that up there, Carrie. In my way. Take a look over here. Yeah, I love it. Perfect. That was so much fun. Good trip. And many days we would have Bailey's in our coffee to start. So that's a very, you know, uh, uh, probably the most famous coffee in the world. Mm. Everybody orders it. Now, Jen, let me ask you a question. Do you, is that, uh, do people often order an Irish coffee in Vietnam? Is that on menus at any coffee bar? Yeah. Mm, I'm, oh, so, I'm sorry. I, uh, I don't know much about coffee. Um, trust me. Whenever I drink coffee, uh, my heart is faster. I don't feel comfortable when I, I drink coffee. Caffeine. Ah, exactly. Okay. Because of the caffeine. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. We were talking about that last night with my brother in law. Uh huh. But uh, I remember last uh, last week, uh, uh, oh, uh, Michael, uh, no, uh, uh, Richard, uh, Richard uh, make the, um, the the drink uh, in which he, yeah. he added add, uh, an ad. Uh, and hey, I know Jones, in, in we're looking at your pills mm -hmm. on the counter. You might want to move that iPad. Welcome to the world of Zoom. Mm. You know, in Hanoi, in Hanoi, um, coffee with egg uh, is uh, um, the favorite, uh, okay, the favorite drink. Uh, but I've never tried it. I hope one day I will try it. It's good. Wow, <laughs> you tried Two it. Thumbs up. Oh, it's mm. delicious. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we need Richard for that one. That's his area of expertise. Yeah, mm. it's a uh, it's it's called egg coffee, and it's ah, egg coffee. so good. Mm -hmm. You have many ways of making coffee in Vietnam. Yeah. Unfortunately, I I can't drink coffee. I drink. Well, uh, I can't drink it either. But there are decaffeinated types of coffee, and when you mm. come here, I think you might find some unique opportunities to explore some more of those things that maybe you had at home because they're not as readily available, but here they are. Uh -huh. So it's, it's kind of neat. There's a lot of extra things and it is uh, uh, Maria, our Maria who works with us. Her birthday was recent this past week um, and, and a shout out to her Richard both on birthday, but their daughter take her daughter took her to a, a coffee bar. So you might go to a wine tasting well, it was a coffee tasting, and they had a variety mm. of unique and different things. And that's a new experience that's opened up here locally. But I know in Ludenburg, and especially in Halifax, there's extraordinary amount of those um, experiences for people to go down there. And I think it's called Number Nine, Roz. Give me a thumbs up. They're a really fantastic coffee bar um, that we order from. Yeah, Number Nine, and I love it. And it, they're really kind of cool. And what you see about them is everything that they do down in Lunenburg, they serve it in mason jars or reusable containers. So it is very much in the conserving as well. So a little shout out to them in Lunenburg. And uh, you have your coffee and then you bring your jars back. 
So it's really neat and it's extremely well done. A very fun experience. Our students mm. love to go there. Yeah. Uh, two years ago, when I visited Canada, I uh, I tried uh, the coffee of uh, Tim Horton. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it is different uh, from uh, coffee in Vietnam. Mm. What did you think about it? Mm. Oh, I love it, Carrie. Uh, uh, no? To be honest, uh, I, I don't like coffee, okay? And uh, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> to me, so then you it's not good at all. Important. <laughs> so I agree with that. But you know, for all the coffee lovers in the world, um, uh, we're going to be bringing uh, an Irish coffee hour coming up here shortly, or hour, mm. shouldn't say that, we have an hour. But mm. it is a time zone change. We were discussing mm. that earlier. And we have a feeling that we, we might have uh, people joining in at 10. So we're going to roll through. We've got some things we want to get into the oven. So it is March 14th. My mm. name is Michelle Alcorn, otherwise known as Maple Chef Michelle, a uh, very proud president and co-owner of, uh, of Atlantic Canada Language Academy. And we are so excited about, you know, each and every week we get to be insp bring inspirations from around the world and St. Patrick's Day is coming up. And it's one of those really great holidays that really does transcend. People have different ways to celebrate or acknowledge it around the world but it's 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 extremely prominent in Atlantic Canada and um, that's really because of that's where our history comes from we have family on my side that's come over from Ireland you know my my sister's uh, husband and their family are all ha have immigrated from Ireland and it's an incredible amount you know going back to you know the 15th 16th century that's when in Ireland and England it's really a big piece and we've got Maureen McMullen on here, Richard's mom. She's in Liverpool. But Maureen's going to be coming to us here in a few minutes and, and bringing us some scones. She recently moved back from Ireland this past September. And she's going to be spending part of her time in Canada, part of her time in Ireland, where her heart is often. But um, obviously, once things get safe in the world. So we've got some exciting recipes and we really are just going to be celebrating. And because we cook a lot of this food in Atlantic Canada, when uh, Richard and I were discussing putting this menu together, it just was easy because it's so readily available. And I know um, I'm going to walk through the menu. One of the first recipes we're going to be doing is going to be an Irish soda bread. And we're going to get Roz going because we want to get that in the oven so that we can see that from start to finish. So no pressure on that one, buddy. Hoping that rises and does what it needs, right? And she's got a really great story to go with that. We're excited to share because one of the things we say here at, you know, at Atlanta Canada Language Academy and everything is about a story and it's really about people getting to come in and share that. And everybody on this call today and every Sunday has stories that are attached to every one of us. So thank you. And um, I'm excited. So I should get my Irish coffee going so I can actually start my morning that way. But let's have a chat about our exciting menu today. And I'm going to turn it around, not that I don't know it, but I'm going to do an Irish box tea. And, and I cooked a similar recipe in my past. I've never put this all together. Mom will make sure there's some left over for you this afternoon. It's one of my best friend Trina's birthdays and she is very excited. So I promised to deliver her one of those. And I put a bit of a twist on that, Atlanta Canada style. And I put the Irish pot de cam. They're already made and um, they've been tested and quality control tested. And they're fantastic. So I'm excited to share that really fast, simple recipe that will be a repeat. And uh, just fried cabbage and bacon, which what's better than that? I have to say there's an homage in my bacon to Lynn Kopa. It's cooked exactly the way she likes her bacon cooked. So, um, and it's a perfect consistency. Yeah, to go into this recipe. Irish soda bread from Roslyn here in Riverview. That's gonna be exciting. And Irish coffee chat with Richard. So he's going to be taking us through a lot of the history of where did St. Patrick's Day come from and what that looks like. And, and an unbelievable omelet from Vietnam that looks like it's inspired for today. So we're really excited to hear about that and the scones from Maureen. So I don't know about you, but I am now officially extremely hungry. 
So mm -hmm. I'm excited to roll this over to my capable partner and best chef friend. Are you ready, Rose? Let's talk about your soda bread. Cool. Hi, gang. Um, I actually first discovered this recipe in Ireland in the 1980 when I was uh, traveling around Ireland, actually all of Europe and uh, in the British uh, islands for a year and a half. So we were uh, tenting in a lady's yard and she made this beautiful soda bread. It was so good. It's the number one recipe in my travel guide that I took. And that's, that is my traveler checks, the numbers in case I lost them. And guess what? These ones get stolen in Ireland when I was there. Anyway, it's a long story. That's a different one. We won't go there. But here I am. It's a whole meal soda bread. I've never made it. I brought the recipe back with me in, in, when I came home in 1981. But I've never made the recipe. And then when Michelle said we're doing an Irish theme, I'm thinking, I got to make that soda bread. I've been carrying it around with me now for 40 years. I've got to make it about 42 yeah. years. So now I got, I have to make it. So bear with me because it's, uh, I don't have a sifter, but I have this handy dandy sieve. So I'm going to, you have to sift the flour. It's, oh, let me, let me move my camera down a little bit. Just a second. This is going to be dangerous. So you need to sift the flour so that it's the white flour so that it is very light and airy. Whoops, get a little on the floor because that's just what you do. And you have to put in, so it's, it says eight ounces. So I had to Google, it's one and three quarters of a cup of white flour, a, a teaspoon of soda, a, a two teaspoons of cream of tartar. I'm gonna put that in and sift that as well and uh, a, a teaspoon of salt and it all gets sifted into the bowl and that's that done and so then after that you have to stir in it said whole wheat flour but I had to do not multi uh, multi-grain so I did a, a 12 grain so I'm going to stir in 12 grain flour and it's a very simple recipe so I'm stirring that in to get it all stirred up and then the only other thing you do is you rub in it says margarine so can you imagine I'm using butter but it's called for margarine back in the day that's it was very popular in the 80s to have margarine instead of butter so I have, and it says to rub it in. So I have no idea how to rub butter into a recipe. So I'm just going to stir it in uh, gradually, I think is the plan. So Rob, I just want to add one funny thing on the margarine. We grew up as a big margarine family. So I think that's very, very hysterical and did do a lot. But rubbing it in, uh, use your fork. So that's oh, one thank of the you. things that, okay. the that you want to be able to do. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So that so will break it up. In, like, thank you, Michelle. <laughs> So there's my uh, rub in. <laughs> and got to get all that butter in because it's just too yummy. And there's a funny story about butter these days, but I'm not going to go there. So I'm going to continue rubbing in the butter to get it well blended. And then it calls for a eight ounces of um, uh, or sorry, a pint of milk. So a pint of milk is actually one cup. Again, this is a uh, back in the 80s that, and in Ireland, everything's measured. In, um, Maureen, you could probably back me up on this, but it's everything's measured in pints and ounces and instead of cups, whereas it, around here we do. So yes. then you have a cup of water, of milk, sorry. And I'm using oat milk just because I don't do dairy very well. And... It said to just until it's moistened. And looks like it's going to take the full cup. And that's it for ingredients, believe it or not. And then I have to knead it and then pop it in the oven for 35 minutes. 
So this is going to take a little while. I don't know if you want to continue on, Michelle, or not, but I still have to get it to the point where I'm kneading it. And I, I don't know if, it, if everybody knows what kneading is. It's when you yeah, Ron, think for it. Tell us what kneading is, and, and we really do need, yeah, we prefer a time. Well, we really need to move on. And we're going to come back for you and move back in. Yeah, the kneading is when you, get, when you get the flour and the more in the liquid all together, and then it turns into a dough. And then when you when you grab it, see how it gets a little bit more consistent. See how it gets to an evolve. And kneading is when you put it on the table, and you put a little bit more flour down so it doesn't stick to your cutting board, and you 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 um, you take it and you keep rolling it into each other. So I'll show you, it's actually ready to be kneaded. Let me show you what, what I actually mean. Let me get rid of this one. So I sprinkle, get rid of my handy dandy book. Can you see my counter? Yes, you can. So you sprinkle a little bit of flour down and then you take your flour, your, your dough and then you just keep kneading it in so that the, the liquid stays together. And that's what you do for kneading. And you do this until it's ready. And then you just sprinkle a little bit more flour on top and you pop it in the oven. And it'll look like this eventually. So there, back, there you go. Talk soon. That was perfect, Roz. And I think what's really neat, I wanna ask um, Roz, how long will you actually need that for? And if someone's doing it, what's the reference point when you know it's ready? Uh, Oh, sorry, I thought I was on mute. So you need it, you don't, you need, just need it so that you get it to the point where it's consistent, like a dough, so it stays together. And Maureen, maybe you can help me with this because you need bread all the time, you've made bread. So how long do you need the, uh, the, um, the, the bread before you put it in the oven? I think Maureen's, Maureen's volume's not on, Ross. She's gonna oh, okay, so it, it's not, it's not that long. Is it you? But you might, yeah, go um, ahead, Maureen. Okay, I'll go ahead now. Um, normally, I, I need it for about um, eight minutes. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the tip. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what we're going to do? We're, that's awesome, Ross. So we're going to make sure we loop back around to see that finished product of bread. So in, 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 in getting along in our menu, we're going to get Maureen's going to come in. And she's going to talk to us about scones. And the great thing about scones is it is one of those items. And, and as she'll say, it's a, served at many tea houses. And it's a popular item that you see around. Yes. So, and it's something again, and, and we were speaking last night uh, and talking about this. And we see scones a lot here. And I know my mom and Joan's on there. My mother loves a scone. So nothing like, you know, a good scone on a day to get going. So we're excited for you to share your recipe. And that is an extremely popular Atlantic Canadian option. So please tell us more. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Shall I go ahead now, Michelle? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, basically I'm using um, a recipe that I found um, the online. Um, it's, uh, it's called Gemma's um, Traditional Irish Scones. And uh, anyone can just go online and get that recipe. But the reason I like it is because she just uses the, the old fashioned traditional way of, of, of making scones. And I've already got my flour sifted into, if you can see my bowl or not. Um, anyway, I've got my flour sifted and uh, I'm ready. I've got all my dry ingredients ready actually in, into my bowl here. And what I'm going to do now is just add all the other ingredients. Um, just to, it's kind of a messy process because Gemma uses her fingers. <laughs> so my fingers are going to be going into, into this uh, process here, if that's okay. I'll just show you now. I, I won't bother with uh, the actual instructions for the recipe because you can just get it online and it's uh, going to take up a little less time, okay? So I've already got the flour and the baking powder in, and now I'm putting in the sugar. You can put, you can put more or less sugar, but uh, I'd say half a cup of sugar is just about perfect. But you can put more or less depending on, some people don't like too much sugar and 
some people like more. So I'm just gonna do it this way. So now I've got the flour, the baking powder, and the sugar in this bowl now here. And the next thing I'm going to do is add, um, it's three quarter cups butter, but the, the whole idea, that's where the fingers come, come in because you actually have to knead this butter into the flour and your mixture with your sugar and your baking powder by hand. Gemma actually uses frozen butter, which is probably um, better actually, just that I don't want to do that this morning. I don't have to really, but so just give me a few minutes here while I knead this all in here. Maureen, I just want to add in, and, and I'm not the baker on here, so if there is a baker that wants to put in the chat, but there's an important piece about using chilled butter, especially when you're making a pastry like a scone and it's the cold that allows, it's sort of a bit of a chemistry piece and, 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 and yes. it's really important yeah. for it to work that way. So even if it doesn't be frozen, I think there's that chilled piece, right, Maureen? That's and, right, yes. Yeah, so talk maybe a little bit more about the why behind that. Because a lot of people mm -hmm. that don't bake wouldn't know they would just say, well, I can substitute regular butter. You're not going to get the same result, right? No, no, no. I mean, it has to be, it has to be very, very cold. It has to be really cold butter or frozen butter. Yeah. Um, warm butter would not be good at all because the whole idea also with this um, process is that while it's baking bits, of, you know, bits and pieces of the butter are actually melting into the, into the, the scones. And that gives a really lovely, and beautiful flavor and kind of a flakiness to it as well. I've got my hands really messed up really good now. <laughs> well, the good news is that you're perfectly placed and you can get, you can just keep delivering your recipe. And then when we're done, I can help you with the button. So we're all good to go on that one. <laughs> Okay, I so now I, I've, I've got this kind of, um, yeah, to the stage where I want it to be. And now the next stage basically is adding the cream. I'm using um, a, a light cream and I need three quarters of a cup. You can mix it with your eggs as well before you pour it in, but I'm, I'm just doing it separate. It doesn't really matter. You can do it one or the other. You can mix the water, the milk rather with your eggs or just um, put it in separately. Because again, it's all to do with consistency. It can't be too dry and it can't be too wet. Now I'm just going to mix a little bit of that with my eggs, which I've already whipped and put those in. Two eggs, by the way. But like I say, I haven't written down the recipe for you. So just go online and look up Gemma. Maureen, we'll get it afterwards and then we'll post it. So we and I can connect afterwards and we'll get it down because you put some really good Maureen Liverpool Nova Scotia twist to it. So we'll actually get that out and we'll put a little link to that. So what are you combining now? Well, I'm combining the uh, whipped eggs and I've already put, I've put the cream in, the cream and whipped eggs. And now really this is kind of the final uh, stage because this is the great thing about scones is that they're so incredibly simple. But basically now it's to get the right consistency so you can you know, roll it out and cut them out, you know. So you have to just really be careful at this point because if you put too much liquid in, it won't work. It'll just be a soggy mess, you know. But I think, I'm thinking that it's actually coming to pretty good consistency right now. So 
But Maureen, what happens sometimes? I think a lot of people flavor scones. So in your experience, you could, yeah, are they, absolutely. They probably do a lemon one that my mom does and will grate a little bit of the rind off the lemon or put a little bit of lemon juice in the batter. So it really gives it that amp. What are a couple of the flavors that you like to add to them? Well, you could add raisins to it. Raisins is a really good one because that's the, I say that's more of a traditional one that they would use in Ireland would be raisins. I, I haven't got raisins in it today, but I would, I would, I would think you could add practically any flavor you like to them. But traditionally in Ireland, I'd say mostly it's um, raisins, you know? You would either get plain ones or you would get ones with raisins in. So this is going to get all, all kind of messy again <laughs> with the, the hands, of course. So tell us a little bit about what's going to go on next as you're getting this into the oven. So, and how long is it going to cook for? It has to cook for um, um, not very long, actually. I'd say 10 to 12 minutes at 425 uh, Fahrenheit or 210 centigrade. Okay. And right now I'm just getting ready to put onto the platform here. And I think it's going to be okay now. Oh, we've got Emily said that she's added all spice and butter and different dough and then uh, as a recipe for gluten-free. Definitely want that gluten-free dough recipe. Um, well, the, again, I, I say for scones, um, you can really, once you've, once you've done the basic recipe, you can pretty much add whatever, whatever is your favorite um, spice or, you know, what, use the flour that your, is your preference. But traditionally in Ireland, Ireland, they're just using white flour, you know, but it could be gluten-free flour, of course. But, um, Maureen, tell us, well, you were in Ireland, because we're going to get yours into the oven, and we're going to move over. I'm going to introduce one of the recipes I'm doing, and we're going to have some coffee talk with your wonderful son. But as you're getting those shaped, show us one once you get it done, like Roz did. But tell us, what would be your favorite place that you would go get scones with when you were, where would you go in Ireland? What was your favorite? Uh, <laughs> there's just so many different places. Um, there's um, a couple of really neat places in uh, Killarney. That, like there's a, um, a pub called uh, Murphy's and you can go in there and get fantastic scones. And right across the road from where I live in Ireland is the Thatch Cottage Restaurant. And they actually do bus tours. They take bus tours there to get their, their scones. Their scones are famous. So it's called the Thatch Cottage Restaurant and it's Cahir Savine, County Kerry. So that's a good one to know. So now I've just I've just got this into I guess it's about a, about an inch and a and a half thick my dough. And I actually don't have a a spoon cutter so I guess I'm going to have to just use a cup. <laughs> Which is fine, you know. So really you coming out with can you see this now? Yeah. Do you see the Thatch Cottage, Mom? The Thatch Cottage restaurant right across the road, Rich. Oh, there it is, Richard. Talk for a second so it goes over to you. Yeah, this is the cottage she's talking about. It's across oh, the road there. So we can see pavement. Oh, really? There you go. Other way. You see it now? It's a Thatch no, Cottage. More pavement. Go the other direction. Hmm. Hang on. Give me a second. Give me a second. There it is. No, you got it. You got it. Oh, good, good. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, very that's cool. the so you can see it, it has a thatched roof and it's a kind of a cottage thing. It's very busy uh, when there were tourists. Very busy. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a brilliant spot, really. So I'll uh, just give you an idea now. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see the bowl? Hello? No, move it up a little bit, Maureen. There you go. Yeah. yeah. A little bit so, higher. A little higher. There you go. Okay. Yeah, we see them. 
Yeah, so basically now they're, they're just going to go into the oven and um, bake for 12 minutes and voila. <laughs> Same as the biscuits. Yeah. Hi! My sister Claire, we had a sleepover last night. Hello there. Hello, Claire. We stayed up very late talking in front of the fireplace. So we're both there a little tired. <laughs> and then we lost an hour. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Claire. Hi, Welcome to Hi, Atlanta Canada Cook. <laughs> I'm just looking and 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 and, and I'm looking forward to those getting in the oven and we're gonna come back around to see that finished piece. I've got a recipe that's on the go here, and I'm going to talk about the, the fried cabbage piece, and then I'm going to mix up my box tea. We're going to go over to Richard for some Irish coffee talk. So one of the things that is popular is, you know, fried, and I don't know if people, cabbage is underrated. Fried cabbage is absolutely fantastic. And it's it really is healthy, wonderful. And it's a great yeah. vegetable and offers a lot. So I've got this in the pan and I've cut it up. And if, I don't know if you can see that well, but there's some, a lot of really nice browning on the cabbage. Do you see that? Yes. So I am cooking this down in the pan right now. So I've had it cooking in behind me here for about 15 minutes. And here's my moment of missing my lovely sous chef mum. Um, so it's simmering away. And the only thing that's in the pan is it, I would, if I would have had purple cabbage, I would have put both for pretty, but it is green cabbage and then some sliced regular white onion in it. And then of course I put some fresh thyme and um, one of the other ingredients that's gonna go into this lovely dish is bacon. So I've got a nice bowl yeah. of just not super crispy, but partially, and I've left it chunky. And if you can see the size where I left the chunks, how I cut them because you really want to get a bunch of that and a definitely a big piece of bacon within this recipe. So that's gonna cook down pretty much through for about another 20 minutes as well. I'm not gonna put the bacon in right away. I am gonna add the bacon about the last five minutes because if you really want that bacon flavor to sort of stay on top. The only other ingredient that goes into the recipe is chicken stock. So it is extremely simple. I use olive oil in the pan. And like I said, you're simmering down the cabbage and the onions and the thyme. And as it browns down, I'm gonna add probably about a cup and a half of chicken stock. So it gives it some consistency and it cooks down again. And then we'll add that bacon and you'll see how beautiful that looks. I'm gonna to be topping that on top of my box tea. So I'm using that beautiful fried cabbage that's gonna be served with the box tea that I'm making. And um, in that, I've made it a bit more in a savory tone. So you'll sort of see how that comes together. So I'm gonna come back around with that boxy recipe, but cabbage is simmering away. And then I think if Richard, you're ready to go over and have some Irish coffee talk, I've been waiting to make a coffee since you got here, but everybody was doing a little bit of chat with coffee. Uh, I'm so earlier. sorry. I was, as you can see, there's a green thing on my, my forehead here, and I was oh. trying to affix this tattoo, this temporary oh. tattoo, and it was not working. And every time I went to rip it off, it wasn't, so I, I kept wetting it, but uh, eventually I had to, and now I can't wash this off either. It won't come off. So, <laughs> so as, as women on the call, we're going to tell you, you can use, I don't think you're going to have any makeup remover, but if you use <laughs> lotion, hand lotion afterwards on it and let it sit for a second, it should take it off. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's a shamrock. It, like, it was supposed to look like that anyway. <laughs> you just made our day, buddy. I love the way that you said that. I need you to know last night when he and I and Maureen were talking, we were really excited to have some of our extra Irish props ah, perfect ready for you so Richard let's have some Irish coffee and That's talk fantastic. Now, now I should be wearing green but um, this is very dark 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 green and it's an Aaron sweater so it's very Irish that Can't is get very Irish beautiful I'm going to make an Irish coffee um, so the ingredients are brown sugar Mm -hmm. and 
a glass, uh, a fancy glass, of course. Uh, now, normally, normally you put some cream in there, but because I'm, um, I'm not really a big gluten kind of person, I'm going to try it with coconut milk. I've already tried it last night, and it works perfectly. So um, all I need now is the coffee, and I've got my, my most Irish of coffee cups here, O'Shea's uh, Casino Las Vegas. So... <laughs> And the way, the way you build it, um, you have to build it by layers. So you go by weight. And before I do that, I'll just give you a little history. The, the, the coffee itself was invented in the 1950s at uh, Shannon Airport, a pub near Shannon Airport. There was a stopover. It was American troops, and they were um, afraid to continue over the ocean because of, of a weather sort of thing. So they had to stop over for a while. But the mission was so important, it wasn't like they could stay long. So they were stopping, hanging out a bit, having some coffee. And that's how, that's the story. That's the tale of how these, this was invented. Is that, is that Dirty Nellies? <clears throat> it's not Dirty Nellies because if it was, they would advertise that, but it, it's Shannon oh. Airport anyway. Oh. It's, um, I'm not sure if it's the pub in Shannon Airport mm. or a pub around it, but that's, that's the story. But since then, the Irish coffee formula has gone all over the world. So it's, you can have a Mexican coffee, uh, and that's with uh, tequila. Um, any any kind of local drink, you take your local liqueur and put it in there. So uh, obviously in Ireland, it was <clears throat> it was whiskey was added. So <laughs> it was the Irish. But a lot of people make it also with um, Irish cream, Bailey's, something like that. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to see if I can get this a little closer. Okay, I think this works. I'm actually going to make two today over the course of today. And I'm going to try it uh, later with the Canadian maple syrup and see if that works. I don't see why it wouldn't. It definitely would, Richard. <laughs> it definitely would. Yeah. So basically, you, you put in first ingredients go the heaviest. So I'm putting in the brown sugar now. That's the heaviest. Break it down a little bit. Then add a little bit of whiskey. Like that. And then I'm going to mix that up in there. And I'm going to add the coffee, which just came straight out of the coffee maker. So it should be pretty warm. And then, and then I'm going to carefully add the milk on top so it doesn't so you want to try to get it to, to sort of rest on top that's why i was talking about layering before so what Looking i'm going to good. what i'm going to do here is pour it over a spoon richard can you pull it forward just a little bit closer to the edge of the cutting board towards us because just the coffee no 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 no, no. the coffee not the camera there you go because we can really, there you go. Nice. Yeah. So this is actually working out quite well with the coconut work. It's, it's resting right on top. You're getting the, the color that you want because this, uh, in this in a way, it kind of resembles a Guinness, a properly poured Guinness. So that's also what kind of makes it Irish as well. To look like a, to look like a pint of stout, but it's a coffee. And we have, if you remember, I taught you uh, last, Last week, what did we do to it? We've, we've Irished it up. <laughs> so that's what it looks like from the top there. Good job, Richard. When I, uh, when I owned a bar, they, when they, we used to do shooters, and I taught the staff how to layer by using a spoon. So very good technique. And then yeah. after you get really good at it, you don't need it. You just pour very slowly, and it works. Yeah, yeah. I've actually made... Probably two or three hundred Irish coffees. No, even more than that, because I was a bartender for a long time. But when I was a promoter in um, Germany, I, I used to get sponsorship from Telemore Dew. That that was that tattoo, by the way, if you saw it, was from Telemore Dew. So I guess um, I guess it was the age thing that was involved there as well. But uh, we we would set up a stand and sell Irish coffees all night long. So. You get an expert at like doing doing them in uh, you know dozens and dozens at a time really vic quickly. So, uh, but with the cream, it pours really well, and you just have to have the hot coffee, and it, it always rests on top. So this looks this looks really nice now, doesn't it? You can see how it's resting right on top there. Perfect. 
Oh. And it's, it's um, 1241 here, so it's okay to have, you know, an Irish coffee. <laughs> It'd be a terrible thing in Nova Scotia, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> But then again, um, but then again, it's quite late around the world with uh, with this. You know, what time is it in Vietnam? Seven forty-two. Okay, uh, a quarter to eight p.m. So that's the normal time for you. You you guys never change, do you? No, no, no. We we yeah. have one hour forward. Oh, you do. Okay. <laughs> No, no, no. In Vietnam, no. We we follow we follow uh, uh, the the time zone in Canada. So uh, last week uh, it started at eight p.m., but uh, today we started at seven p.m. Okay, so that's better for you. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Things are getting better. More that's convenient. good. <laughs> right. <Here's to> that. <laughs> yeah. So Richard, I love the coffee, and I want to I'm going to add a piece. With the urban joy, and I get this chicory chai tea that she did, and it's very, very unique and different. It's a, a much bolder type of flavoring. And when I realized, because I, I don't drink coffee, um, so I always think for caffeine tea and mixtures, and 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 I was always a big fan of Bailey's in my coffee in the morning. So I, or or, Car or Caroline. So today I do have Caroline's. So I am giving an homage to Urban Joy and their incredible tea because the combination of what she has in here, which is chicory root, cinnamon, ginger, cloves, nutmeg, cardamom, carob, and peppercorns gives it a really nice, strong flavor. So Richard, I have your Irish flu shot. Oh yeah. Pewter glass that was with all the nice little shamrocks. So I just added um, some to my tea. And it's fantastic. And it's really hot, I might add. So I might have misjudged the temperature thing on that. But another great way to Irish up your tea. So thank you for that inspiration. I'm just going to give you guys a time check on my recipe here. We've got the box tea that needs to go in. Um, but Richard, I want to bring it back around to you telling us a little bit more of the stories, but I want to give you guys the recipe. So we've had a few people join. What's going on in this pan right now is we've got some beautiful cabbage and I hope you can start to see that consistency. It almost looks like noodles, interesting enough, but the way I cut the cabbage, it's all brown now. And what I'm going to add is a lot of chicken stock or whatever stock that you would have and just allow that to simmer down so the cabbage cooks through. But of course, I'm gonna add, and here's the money shot for everybody, the bowl of bacon now. So that's the wonderful ingredient that's gonna be going into this. And I can see Rosalind smiling. Okay, that's gonna be in her future. So I'm gonna let that simmer for about 10 minutes and it'll be ready. Um, but I am gonna put the ingredients to the box together. And I'm going to throw it back over to Richard because this is a really easy and very interesting recipe. So what I have in here is two grated potatoes and they're stuck to the bottom of the pan. This, because one of the things, and I grated them on a box grater, like a cheese shredder, is then I drain them in a strainer to get all the moisture out. So if you're going to do this recipe, do not skip that step. So this is raw potato. It's two potatoes. I see Maureen smiling. So it took some really nice local potatoes, which by the way, here in Atlantic Canada, unbelievable amount of potatoes. So that's probably one of the things. So that is, so that's going into the bowl. The other thing that's gonna go into the bowl, and these are beautiful mashed potatoes. I decided to be fun and I used two different kinds of potatoes. Perfect. So what, yeah, so I've got, I've got a local, two different New Brunswick potatoes. And um, so this is white, a white flesh and a yellow flesh. So this is cooked potato. I cooked it down and then I mashed it like a creamy mashed potato. And the one ingredient I know that you know that I added was some nice fresh thyme to it. But when I cooked my mashed potatoes, I did one unique thing. When I was boiling the potatoes, <clears throat> I threw a clove of garlic in there 
Oh, and perfect. I let the garlic boil in with the potato. I drained all the water out, but then I left that garlic that was sitting in with all those potatoes. So it's kind of like a garlic mashed potato that's going in. And then the other ingredient that's going to be going into here is two cups of gluten-free flour. So these are actually more floury than I would make. So it's like half flour, half potato. And then the last ingredient that's gonna go into here is I am using a coconut milk that's going into these. So um, I did a little taste test earlier and they turned out fantastic, but I'm gonna get my hands dirty and get that mixed. But that's all that's gonna go into that. And then I will be able to put those in. So Richard, back over to you to continue our Irish coffee adventure. Well, I, I haven't finished this coffee yet. Um, <laughs> shall I do a little bit about the history of St. Patrick's Day? Yes, please. And okay. <clears throat> I have a shareable screen because I think you have a few slides that you want to share with the group. Yep, I'll put that up there now. Fantastic. So what we were saying is we're going to have some coffee talk for many of our guests that are on today. Richard is uh, director of international recruitment, and he is lives in Ireland, but he's uh, from Liverpool, Nova Scotia area. So we're really excited he's going to be coming home. So, but he brings this update fresh from Ireland. So Richard, we look forward for you to tell us a bit more about the real history in Patik. Yeah. I will. Can you see the? Can you see the screen now? I can see it. Yeah, perfect, Richard. Okay. So I'm going to put up a little slideshow there. Okay. Okay, so this is Ireland, the land of saints and scholars. And there's, there's a nice Irish man and a nice Irish dog. And there's a nice, uh, a typical view in Ireland of, a, of a, an, Irish, an Irish backyard with a, um, with a rainbow. <laughs> this is most mornings in Ireland. Okay, um, we actually went forward one. So where is Ireland in the world? Here we are in Africa, here's South America, North America, Ireland is obviously here. It's the most Western country in Europe. And um, where am I in Ireland? I'm right down, this is Europe as you can see down here. Where am I? I'm right down here in Kerry. This is where Kerry Gold is from. And it's the most Western point of Ireland. In the old days when people thought the earth was flat, this was the, this was the area. If you kept sailing beyond here, you'd fall off the edge. And this, this was the, uh, the last point, the last point. This is called Michael Scaling. And that's the most Western point in Europe. And um, these are beehive huts that monks built in the seventh century. And of course, Ireland is very famous for quite a few things. <clears throat> Mostly it's the way it looks. And so you can see the Cliffs of Moher here. You can see the landscape. It's known to be very green, the green Emerald Isle is what it's called. And it's also known for the animals of Ireland. So as you can see, what do we have here? The green sheep, green sheep of Kerry. One of the most famous dogs is the tallest, I think it's the tallest dog in the world, is the Irish Wolfhound. And it's, it's massive, as you can see here, standing up against somebody. Here's um, the Irish cows, very famous in the cowgirl, the Connemara pony, and the Irish setter is very, very uh, popular. And here's a picture of an Irish setter <coughs> with an Irish sitter. <laughs> He's a sitting man, an Irish sitter. That's my joke of the day. <clears throat> also, the people of Ireland are something that uh, the country is very well known for. It's a very small country. It's only 4 million, but you, you have to admit it makes a big impact around the world. It's a lot of famous people, a lot of, a lot of influence in a lot of ways. In, in the world of acting, we have Brenda Fricker, Richard Harris, that's this man here, Pierce Brosnan, he's uh, played a lot of James Bond films, Liam Neeson, everybody loves him. He's, uh, he's got a special set of skills. You don't want to mess with him. <laughs> that's not his accent at all. Uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, of course. Um, and then we have the musicians, which are, which are very famous. I think you can recognize quite a few from here. This is uh, Bono from U2, Shane McGowan from the Popes. Uh, for rock bands, Thin Lizzy, uh, Sinead O'Connor, Bob Geldof. 
And probably the most famous would be Van Morrison down here, Van Morrison. And um, of course, Dolores O'Riordan from, from the Cranberries, who's no longer with us, unfortunately. The music is something that, uh, that makes the country so famous. It's because of the, the, the style of the music and the, the mood of the music. And there's, it's a singing nation. It's a nation of singers and musicians. Everywhere you go, you find music. So these are some of the instruments. This is the barin, the native drum. These are the alien pipes. They're like the bagpipes, but you don't blow into them. You just, you just um, squeeze them under your arm. And the fiddle, which is uh, native to pretty much all the, uh, <clears throat> all the music that comes out, all the traditional music. Now the Irish have had a huge influence on, on Canada as well. About one in every 10, sorry, 3 million Canadians trace their ancestry back to Ireland. So the, uh, the music has a big influence, especially on the East Coast where we're located in Nova Scotia and uh, Newfoundland and New Brunswick. So you'll find a lot of Irish influence in the music that comes out of there as well. And of course the music leads to the dancing, isn't it? <laughs> Which is quite famous. <clears throat> so who was St. Patrick then? He's the most famous guy of all who's Irish. He wasn't even Irish. He wasn't Irish at all. He was, uh, he was stolen. According to his own journal, he was stolen from Roman Britain. So many people suspect he was stolen from possibly Wales or uh, just up the coast, up the coast from Liverpool. And I actually lean more towards that because in his writings, he grew up as a Roman, right? He wasn't exactly a Briton, but he was a Roman um, he was uh, the son of a Roman consulate or something like that. <clears throat> and they, you know, they had a kind of a little bit of a fort and he was stolen somehow by Irish raiders who came and um, took him. And by the time he uh, escaped and it took him about 15 years to escape, but by the time he escaped, the Roman empire was dead. So it's quite, uh, if you can imagine how much the world is changing right now, imagine what it was like back then. Cause when he left and, 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 he had, it was the Roman world, Roman empire. And when he was stolen, he grew up as a shepherd. Well, he, he spent his time growing up as a shepherd. They think he was born around three, possibly 380. So he might've been stolen in 395. And the Roman empire fell in 410. And this troops started leaving Britain between 4, 405 and 410. So by the time he escaped and went back home, everything was gone. His family was gone, everything else. So he went to France, which was, you know, still Roman, I think. And this is where he got his education and he became a Christian. And when he, um, he had a vision, you know, and something said, go back to Ireland. You must go back and Christianize these people, these heathens. And that was, that became his job. So that's, that's the story of St. Patrick. Um, you can see here the, the picture, the nice one in the, the, with the blue background. That's in St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. So this is exactly what he looked like, we think. <laughs> but there's another, there's another, um, and the reason why St. Patrick's Day is on the 17th is because that is his uh, recorded death date, not birth date, but death date in uh, the year three, sorry, 460, I believe. But there's other theories. There's other theories that say he might've lived to be 120 years old if you add up all the things that he's said to have done <laughs> which is why there's uh there's a two patrick's theory as well there's another um patrick that was sent at the time from rome a little bit later uh patricius was his name and as you see the second picture i have up here saint patricus you can see it up here he was um he was probably like he was real for sure so he was probably operating in the south while this guy was operating more in the north and uh eventually all the stories got uh, taken over by this or just handed over to this one. One of the interesting things about St. Patrick's Day though, or St. Patrick himself, is that he's not a recognized saint by the Roman Catholic Church. And that's because when the is Roman Empire- Is that why Empire... it's not a formal holiday? Sorry, Michelle? Is that maybe why it's not a formal holiday? It's just that everybody likes to get together and celebrate holiday because it's not recognized by the church? Well, it, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing because, um, you know, you take New York City, which um, has the largest, I think it's the largest church in, in America, which is St. Patrick's Cathedral. And it's uh, the Diocese of St. Patrick. And, um, you know, they have, the, they have the world's largest St. Patrick's Day parade in the world, actually. Um, Three million spectators and 250,000 visitors 
or sorry, participants. Um, but he's not a, he's not a re- actually a recognized saint because the Roman Church and the Celtic Church divided at that point. Like he he started the, the church in Ireland, but then the Roman Empire fell and we went into the Dark Ages and everything you know retracted. So the Celtic Church developed on its own for another three or four hundred years and it didn't really reunite with Rome until the ninth century. So that's why he's not recognized by Rome. So it's it's kind of an odd thing you have official diocese named after him in places like New York, but he's not really an actually uh, a canonized saint. It's, a, it's an odd thing. So where does the wearing of the green come from? Well, you can see in the top picture, <clears throat> when Irish nationalism started to rise up in the eight, 1800s. Richard, second, Richard, yeah? I have to interrupt you, I apologize, because we're really low on time and we actually have to go back to your mother, Rosalind, and have a recipe to zip through. Okay. So we're loving that, but as you and I were chatting last night, I've got the box to hear, but we've really only got a couple of minutes left. So if you can just maybe wrap up a couple of really quick comments, uh, we really need to get back over because we're really going to run out of time this morning, okay? Okay, yeah, no, I've only got about two minutes left anyway, so. Right. Oh, damn it. What have I done? <laughs> Yeah, so the wearing of the green, it started with, um, you know, pride in the country, and it started off with just the shamrocks, and then it turned into, you know, anything green at all, until today you have St. Patrick's Day, it kind of looks like this, and it gets a bit crazy, a bit fun, and it's celebrated all over the world, as you can see, look at this, we've got um, Sydney, we've got Tokyo, Chicago, they dye the river green, this is Rio de Janeiro, Dubai, Poland, uh, Ayers Rock, this is Copenhagen down here, Niagara Falls in Canada, and um, here, this tower here is in Berlin, and there's, there's me at a St. Patrick's Day party in Berlin a few years ago, having a, having a grand old time, and that's it, that's it, we're, we're done, okay. <laughs> Bravo, thank you, Richard, that was amazing, well done. Yeah, there's, uh, and as I say, when I was pointing out the, the way it's celebrated around the world, there's very few countries that have a, you know, a celebration that's taken up by everyone around the world. You know, well, not every, every single like, nation, but so many. And it's a, so for such a sm- tiny nation of only four million, it's a huge sort of um, impact. And it's a huge thing in Canada as well. In fact, um, what did I want to show? I think I might have missed that. Hey, Roz, you want to tell us what's going on with your bread? Perfect timing, Michelle. The timer's going to go off right now. And out comes the bread. And it's very hot, but looks delicious. How does that look? Can you see it? Wow. There we go. Hey, Maureen, how'd she do? Richard, are you seeing this? Oh, wow. Look at that. Jesus. Oh, you got to get some pictures of that. Delicious. (laughs) My sister Clara's really liking it. We're going to have it for breakfast. (laughs) I picked a good night to stay over. There's my timer. So, Roz, tell us how you're going to serve your bread. Sorry, Michelle. How are you going to serve your bread? What are you guys going to eat it with? Oh, we're going to have breakfast. So we're going to have eggs and bacon and uh, we're going to slice it up and put peanut butter and honey on it and whatever else you want to do. I have some homemade jam as well. So it's, uh, I can't wait to dive into it because it smells delicious. It really does. So there's where we want the smell of vision. (laughs) Exactly. Yep. Very proud of myself. This is my first loaf of bread that I've ever made by myself. My mother used to make the bread. I helped her, but I've never made my own. So I think it's a real deal. Hi, we are so very proud of you on that one, Roslyn. Thank you so much for sharing. So it's almost wrapping up at the end. And I know, Maureen, I think your scones are going to be coming out of the oven. So we're excited to do a round robin of that. I am going to grab over here because I made a fresh box piece. Unfortunately, we didn't. Um, have enough time for me to show you the recipe, um, but here's how beautiful it is turning out. So I have got this one all cooked. 
What I do want to do before we show you the finished thing is this is the consistency that the dough for the box tea came out of. So I could tip it because it's not going to fall over. So it's not so runny, but it's sort of like <laughs> you can scoop it out like a chunk. Now, I think in a traditional one, and one I had done the other day, I put a little bit more uh, milk in it. I added a little bit of uh, chicken stock to thin it out, but I will say I'm very proud of the finished product. With a nice, perfect golden brown on that, and it's hot. So as that fresh and comes out, I am going to serve that, and I'm gonna put my trimmer down, and we're gonna top it off with the beautiful cooked cabbage. So you can see it's got a nice crispy edge. You can see where the potatoes and stuff crust it up. And there we go to top that off with that beautiful fresh fried cabbage. So that is going to be my breakfast I'm going to be enjoying here just in a few minutes. And it's really got a lot of breakfast components to it. I think one of my favorite things, thanks Lynn, about this particular recipe is, is you can turn it into anything. And I'm sure, you know, it's on many Irish pub restaurant, restaurants all over Atlanta, Canada. When you come visit, you'll see that here. You know, it's readily available, but it really, it's, you know, breakfast, lunch, supper. You know, I was going to do a maple, maple and bacon topping on that but it was just so great to have it in this particular one. So I'm really excited on how that has turned out. Um, the other thing I made was the creme de pep. Um, so these beautiful little morsels that I have here, and I don't really wanna tip the whole pan over because it will probably knock my camera over. I did them in little individual servings so that everybody could really see what they look like. And that's really what I wanted to make sure is I had these little ones. I know when my mom comes over later, home from visiting, inside of each of these is our, and it's the Irish pot de creme. So I think when I share the recipe, I think one of the recipes that I have ever made in my life, and I was, I think we all had some explorations today, um, but it literally is dark chocolate one egg and it called for two tablespoons of sugar. I of course use Briggs maple sugar in mine. And then you put all those ingredients together and then I heat I heat it up, it calls for cream, some Irish cream, pour it over the mixture, stir it very quickly, pour it into these and put them in the refrigerator and they're done. Again, extremely simple recipe. We're gonna post it, um, but it, it you could eat them like a little tart. So, and the only ingredient I swapped out instead of cream, I used my Irish cream. So those were my Irish inspired, extremely yummy. And I have to show you all this because that's going to be my dinner with the dessert. How's that look? So mom, I bet your mom was wishing she was here for this week's dinner. <laughs> Maureen, the only thing that's missing is a scone. Are you ready to show us what those beautiful scones turned out like? Because that would certainly be the perfect accompaniment to my dinner, wouldn't it? Oh, mute, on mute. We'll just get you to, I don't know which one you need to unmute, Maureen. There you go. No. Yeah. No, I need to see my mute. I just want mother to look in. Uh, she moved back from Ireland. Yeah, you can hit mute too, Russ. There you okay. go, Maureen. Yeah, my mute did. Perfect. Okay. Can you see the um there, oh right you had it there you hold it up just hold it up like you're doing right now hold it in your hand that works better they look beautiful 
We can only see about half your half your body, so. Well, that doesn't matter about my body. Maureen, <laughs> put the iPad down and hold the scone up, and we can see it in your hand. That might work okay. better, my girl. Okay. Or, yeah. or if you step step to the right, about half a foot. No, the other way. The other right. That's perfect, Maureen. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So then, this is the plate. There. Perfect. That. You see the um, yeah. Just talk to us, Maureen, so the camera goes to you. So tell us what's going on. So what I'm trying to show you basically is um. Here, just let me see if, if this works. You know that somewhere. Uh, I'm trying to show you the uh, the actual scone with the butt with the with the strawberry jam on it. And I. Not sure that it's working. Maureen, maybe we just recommend that you hold it up on a plate because it was easier if you just show it to us like I did versus you. There you go. Perfect. And that looks. And what would make it absolutely completely perfect would be a clotted cream, but I don't actually have any. But you just put that on on top of the strawberry jam. And Tell then... us what that is for, the, for everybody here that wouldn't know what that is. Clotted cream is a really thick, thick, cream that's uh, produced um, largely in uh, Cornwall in the UK but um, any really thick cream will work I mean you can get a you can get thick, thick creams here and in fact I did try to make it but I, I just wouldn't set properly but uh, well, let's that's just stand back a bit because we can only see your arm right now oh yeah I don't know if you maybe <laughs> maybe you go to your right Step over to your right. There you are. A little bit more. One more step to the right. Now we can see you better. There Excellent. You okay. Maureen and all of our guests today, we really want to thank you. You can, there you go, hold that up. We can see that perfect. <laughs> we only wish we had smell o vision and we could taste, put those. And this was a really great example from our kitchens to everyone around the world. And we're really impressed that it, people had made the time zone switch. And, and we have a feeling we might have some other people logging in. Yes. But um, it's been an unbelievably beautiful week of sharing what those um, Irish inspired recipes. And for our listeners from around the world, you'll see that influence when you come here to Atlantic Canada. You'll hear it in the stories that we tell. And it's extremely embedded in the culture that you'll experience when you come here to Atlanta, Canada. Mm -hmm. And it is rich in the Lunenburg region and especially the Halifax and Liverpool where Maureen came in and made her scones. So um, we've got many countries on here today and um, next week is spinach. So Ooh. you're gonna see a whole lot of different recipes come out and we're featuring spinach. And when we chose that is there's an international spinach day in and around that, right? So we're gonna bring you, of course, next, some fun facts and some really unique things about spinach. So uh, we look forward to everybody tuning in at 9 a.m. Uh, and I think it's ADT now, Lynn, we're gonna get you to put that in the chat as we know the time zone has changed. So we, um, what we call spring forward. So we move forward an hour so right now it is 10.08 a.m. in the morning That's in true. Atlantic Canada. So we know that there are some countries on here that would not have the experience that their countries did move forward in time zone. So it is ADT. And um, so, and, and thank you, Lynn. She popped out there where you can get the recipes. So Maureen, I'm gonna get with you later so we can, I'll type up that scone recipe oh. with your twist to it on top of giving credit to where your inspiration came from. Okay. And Roz, I'm so proud of that bread. I that seriously, is wonderful. That was great. So these I think look as good as it is. And that boxy opens up like a... That is absolutely wonderful bread. It's absolutely wonderful. So next Sunday, we're gonna have some amazing recipes from all over the world, inspired by spinach, which I think it's fun, Richard, because we're like keeping the green theme. We're just yeah. gonna bump it ahead another week. So for everybody, please and go and enjoy your evening, your day and whatever it is. And we thank you so much for myself and our team for joining us for Atlantic Canada Cooks.
This was week 32, and we look went for 32 more to come. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. See ya. Bye. Nice to see you. Bye. 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 <laughs>